it's not as simple as oh just make it go boom because there's different you know chemicals to be mixed to give different looks i think i spent basically my entire business savings on that shoot because it was going to be the shoot that would make everything happen and when that did end up happening i was faced with the choice okay well i can either sell what i have now and even if they're not very good but try to recoup some of that money that was spent or try to find a way to shoot some more and do it right this time it's funny i think i was 10 years old when my dad got us a camera and that was kind of when the fascination with film got started hey so as you know the vfx artist podcast is just founded by me and kofi and we run it as an independent thing but Having spoken to Action VFX for this interview, they have offered all of our subscribers 15% off their products. I'll be giving the code at the end of this video, so stay tuned. It's a great interview, and if you're interested in that, stay to the end. Welcome back to the VFX Artists Podcast. This week we have Rudolf uh, Pierre Louis from Action VFX. It's really exciting to have you. We had it took a while to get this one organized. Um, obviously, I know there's a lot going on, yeah. and you're blowing shit up. And <laughs> <laughs> So, it's not all we're doing, but it's part of why we're doing. <laughs> Tell us a bit about about um, who you are and what you do. Yes, yeah, so my name is Wadolf, and I am the founder and CEO of Action VFX, and we are a visual effects stock footage company. We provide different visual effects assets for movies, TV shows, basically anyone who needs to burn something down, blow something <laughs> up. Or not. We have. A, we also have a lot of non-action related effects as well. But that's that's the business that we're in. I mean, I've actually, as a compositor, used um, some of your footage, um, the water footage as well as fire. Um, I just used some fire footage recently, and I've used water footage in the past um, as well as nice. you know, weird stuff like blood and uh, and and dirt and smoke yeah. is a big popular one. <laughs> but it's a, oh, yeah, you never know sure. how much. You... So. I, I, I'm really curious about, well, actually, let's let's roll back. Let's, yeah. let's take it way back. You uh, are Haitian. You speak uh, Creole and French, so I'm guessing you're yes. a Haitian family, or did you move to America as a kid? Or? Yeah, I was born and raised in Haiti, so I moved to the States when I was 12, and I've been here ever since. But, but yeah, originally from Haiti. So you came there, and you went. You studied in Miami. Did you always live in Miami when you from when you came to the States, or...? Did you? Yeah, when we moved, we moved to Tennessee, which is a bit different place for someone from Haiti to move to. Most people would go to a bigger city, but well, yeah, so I lived there and that's where I'm back now. That's where Action VFX were based in Johnson City, Tennessee. And, but yeah, I ended up going to college in Miami and it was during my college years down there that I guess I could say the journey to what is now action vfx kind of started because it's funny i think i was 10 years old when my dad got us a camera and that was kind of when the <laughs> fascination with film got started it was like oh man you mean i can make movies myself so i remember i got a bunch of friends together and we made a 25 minute short film which i don't know how we made a 25 minute short film <laughs> that's that sounds so long now but that's kind of how the love of that got started. And when I moved to the States, I think a year after living in the States, I must have been around 13, was when I discovered that, oh, you can make visual effects on your home computer, like doing things like green screening and, you know, muzzle flashes and lightsabers and all of those stuff weren't something that you only could do if you're in Hollywood. So that's kind of when I started dabbling this is great company called FX Home, and they used to make some really good entry-level software. They've done some better stuff now, but that's kind of when I got my start and just messing around with visual effects and things like that. Fast forward to a few years, during my college years, I freelanced a lot. I mainly directed music videos, and I did some commercials, but it was mainly music videos that, that I did freelance on the side. And... At the same time, that's when I started a YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel was essentially teaching visual effects tutorials. And that started going well, started building an audience for a little bit. And uh, 
uh, YouTube channel name was called Rody Polis and I ended up creating RodyPolis.com as a website. And it was like, hey, we're building an audience. And I've always been very entrepreneurial. So I guess someone like me, like I, I, I love business in general. When I was in middle school, for example, I sold gum <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to the cool. other students. So I'm always looking for something like that. So you when, sold gum. Like, how did yeah. this work? How did you make it? Like, like how much gum are we talking about? <laughs> uh, well, it's like it was a 300 percent profit margin business because I oh. remembered <laughs> I could get four. <laughs> for like packs for a dollar and then I'll sell each pack for a dollar because in middle school gum is like currency right it's like wh whoever has gum is the most popular person so I figured hey why not actually make real currency from from gum but anyways all that to say is my brain is always thinking because I love the idea of having a product and and serving a need and making it better and you know so I'm naturally wired this way so so when i started actually creating an audience for my youtube tutorials the natural next step was how to monetize this like is there a product that i could provide to to the users that would actually help them and you know during that time a lot of the time when i would be editing a music video i would make my own effects for that video so it was kind of felt natural. Hey, you know, why not make, make stock effects? Why? Because if I can make it and use it in my projects and I could make it, someone could buy it. They would have to spend the same time building everything from scratch. So that's kind of how the thought got started. So, so yeah, in 2011, I launched on rodipolis.com. Uh, it was called the shootout stock pack. If you go on YouTube, you can still find the old promo video. They weren't very good assets by my standards now, but it was enough to get started. I think I was selling it for like 15 bucks. So, so that's kind of how I got introduced to the journey of actually creating assets and selling them on the internet. And obviously back then it was very small scale what we were doing. It was just me doing stuff. But then fast forward four years later in 2015 was kind of when had the idea to take things to the next level it was like okay like could could we actually make products that could be used as the highest level of production and that's kind of how work for my for action vfx started and then we ended up launching in 2016. that's really interesting because i mean before that i think the only ones that you could buy that were specifically targeted at VFX artists were really like the, what, the video co-pilot ones mm -hmm. and they had a maximum 2k and then they were so overused that you could sort of any mm -hmm. VFX artist working for a while would start to recognize them they were quite good assets but you, you'd start to go oh yeah I know that I know that yeah. I know that blood splat I've seen that you watch a movie oh, I know that yeah um, for sure and of course you have these big companies like Shutterstock and Pond5 but their target audience is not VFX artists they're mm -hmm. selling stock footage that you use in an edit as footage for your for your video so what particular um things did you have to think about when shooting for compositors so it definitely helped that i had enough visual effects experience by that time to know a little bit about how to essentially i'm the first target customer it's like could i make something that i actually like so mm -hmm. that that helped a little bit but the biggest thing honestly that helped make action vfx what it is now is so back in you know 2015 the very first thing i remember doing was i made the survey to essentially find out what do people actually want in vfx assets because i myself knew of the need for something like that because as you said you're seeing action essential stuff everywhere and that was the only thing and it was like okay so obviously we could use some more diversity but i really didn't want to make just just be another company doing stock assets you know from the get-go it was if this is not going to be significantly better than what is already out there if like if it's not bringing something new to the table then what's the point because you're just going to be 
just another another site that has some stuff, but then people can't really trust it and stuff like that. So, so the first thing I did was uh, launch a survey, and I think we ended up getting about three hundred uh, filmmakers and professional visual effects artists uh, fill it out. And there was a big section on just because you couldn't make something like that multiple choice. It was, hey, what do you need? What do you want? And I remember there were so many great things that some I did think of, like the whole keeping things in frame, because if you're shooting things too close, then, you know, that makes it harder to composite. But there are tons and tons of other great feedback that that I received then that really helped put it in perspective. Like, OK, this is what visual effects artists need. And and that's been a a guiding force for us like i always say listening is our secret weapon we do try to incorporate users mm -hmm. in every step of our process from hey we think of creating a product okay cool that could make a great product it's kind of like well what does the users think about mm -hmm. it is this something people have requested who can we talk to about this like sometimes we'll reach out to different artists and run some ideas by them because again the more we do that the more we can actually serve serve them better yeah um what sort of things um the, the filling in full frame uh for the, anyone that's not in comp but most like most of audience will probably know um it's just important if you've got a smoke element and uh, it touches the edge of frame you know, you can't put that in the middle of the shot. Maybe there's just smoke on the left side of the frame, but you can't put your smoke element on the left-hand side without making a new mask. So if you have the whole of the explosion or the fire or the smoke small within frame, then the advantage, of course, mm -hmm. is that you can put it anywhere. The disadvantage is, of course, you now need a bigger resolution to get the detail that you want. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were think what other things did you get from from your artist survey i'm quite curious about that yeah it's so i, I know yes yeah, staying in frame was a big one different variations was a big deal too because you know a lot of companies they focus on the pack model right like hey i just have this pack and if you just have a pack that contains everything, then there's only so much variation that you can actually add to it. You know, our model is a bit different where we'll have specific collections centered around a specific topic. So if it's ground fire, for example, like for that collection alone, you'll get 30 different ground fires shot at different angles and different wind amounts, different fire amounts. So it's, it's just all of those things that you think about because when you think of compositors in mind, especially if you're trying to serve as many compositors as possible, then obviously you can't just go out and you film the fire in one way because then, hey, that helps some people. But what about the people that need a smaller fire here or a windier fire there? So, so that definitely helped us get uh know a lot of the like what type of variations that users were actually wanting which ended up being super super useful um other feedback were the types of assets that they they really needed but weren't finding a lot out of uh back on the market like not many people were investing in making a lot of smoke for example that ended up being a really something that was very popular among our users because mm. everything could use, you know, some, some smoke yeah. or some you can, you can put smoke everywhere. And... Yeah. You're, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny one because I think it's probably the most common thing that anyone composites into any VFX shot. Mm -hmm. And yet it's overlooked, as you say. I mean, it's kind of a bizarre one that has been overlooked. It's not glamorous. It's not exciting, like the big mm -hmm. explosions, but good smoke is really worth a lot i mean it could just be you've got a, you know a, a a singer on stage and you've got a spotlight and you want to make it look like a real spotlight and having a bit mm -hmm. of smoke go through the volumetric lights is going to make them look nice it could yeah. be that it's a battlefield it could be whatever mm -hmm. yeah so there's definitely a lot of good use for that and and i'll say one last thing from that survey specifically was in terms of how things were shot, like the dynamic wrench, for example, like it's a lot of assets sometimes will just be super overblown and 
and the exposure is just not quite right so we try to retain a lot of those details so you can overexpose as needed for your shot but if let's say you're having fire in the daylight for example like realistically as you're filming that scene your your aperture would be pretty close down like the ex exposure wouldn't be very high at all so therefore you would see a lot of the detail in the fire you'd see the more orange fire as opposed to the overblown white fire but then if as a company we only provide the overexposed fire, then you bring that to a daylight scene and all of a sudden it's kind of like, okay, this doesn't match. It's super bright outside and then this fire is exposed super bright it, and it doesn't make sense. So that was something we had to keep in mind too. And again, at the end of the day, the goal is to just provide more flexibility and more options to users because if you're doing stock and you want to do stock well, you have to just keep in mind that this cannot just help one person. It needs to, like, how do we make something that can help multiple people? So in, in expanding from your few stock elements that you put on your own website to obviously running surveys, having a, web, uh, a big professional website, mm -hmm. filming professional libraries, um, I presume you had to sort of find a lot of talent and hire a few people to kind of get that going. Mm -hmm. How did that, how did you approach that I'm interested yeah. to get in your business mind of how you go about getting the right team on your project. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so okay, again, going back to 2015, so it's still just me, the Rody Polis guy <laughs> who wants to make bigger effects now. And so Action VFX at first, it was definitely just the thought wasn't to make a completely new website and a completely new platform. The thought was just, hey, could I make some explosions for Rody Polis? That was the that was actually the plan at first. And the how I was going going to do that, I remembered I got in touch with some pyrotechnicians. They were living in Chicago and They've worked on movies like Transformers 3, TV shows like Chicago Fire. So it was like, okay, so these guys know how to blow things up. I know how to shoot stuff. So let's go and make it happen. And so it was going to be a pretty sh small crew. It was just going to be me and then a couple friends of mine. One of them was a filmmaker, photographer, and he was going to handle the behind the scenes of the shoot because I was like hey if we're gonna be blowing things up gotta get some good BTS footage from that he ended up dropping at the very last minute and then I went on Facebook and was like hey I need someone to come to Chicago with me to to blow things up I don't know how people responded when they <laughs> when they <laughs> saw that message but Luke Thompson we who is our COO now and he's a part owner of of Action VFX as well so I didn't really know him that much, but we were Facebook friends and he responded and was like, oh, hey, I'll, I'll do it. So that was the first time we ended up working on a project together. And of course, at this stage of things, he wasn't joining as COO, you know, he really was just the behind the scenes guy. But we work very, very well together. And it was like, hey, you know, like I could see, I could see us doing more stuff in the future. Fast forward, you know, that Chicago shoot that we did was a total failure <laughs> because it, it was the first time I was doing something at that scale. And if you would have asked me, I would have said that I overplanned. But when, you're in, when I'm in the shoot, I realized, oh no, I actually didn't plan well at all. There's so many unanswered questions, like so many unexpected things. Long story short, it was bad weren't going to be selling any of those assets. I mean, I could sell them, but then the mission of making something that actually was added substantial value to the market would be missed, right? Because it would have just been like some very average mediocre assets. And I think I spent basically my entire business savings on that shoot because it was going to be the shoot that would make everything happen. And when that did end up happening, I was faced with the choice. Okay, well, I can either sell what I have now and even if they're not very good, but try to recoup some of that money that I was spent or try to find a way to shoot some more and do it right this time. And 
It's like, I'm actually glad the first shoot ended up being a failure because honestly, I was thinking too small at the beginning because as I said, I just wanted a cool explosion pack or whatever. But that failure and having no money was like, okay, well, I'm going to need to find money somewhere. And that's when the idea of doing a Kickstarter campaign, that's when I had that idea because the thought was, well, okay, I think what we're doing here is going to really help a lot of people. So the thought was, well, if it is going to help a lot of people, maybe these same artists would help fund this project and actually help make it happen. So, so yeah, uh, ended up doing the Kickstarter campaign. The goal was to raise 20,000. That was our goal on Kickstarter. Ended up raising 59,000, which was basically three times that, which was great because we did spend all of it to lunch. So, so I'm glad we didn't only raise 20. That would have been, that would have been good. But so yeah, so it was really during the Kickstarter process. That's when I felt, okay, to do a Kickstarter, you need a bigger mission to get people behind. You know, it's not just, oh, we're gonna make this product. So that's when I started thinking a bit bigger and realizing Action VFX really could be the place that solves this lack of diversity we have in the, you know, VFX stock footage market, right? Because we could really not just be making a pack, but making a new platform. And our goal, our ultimate mission would be to be the best, you know, VFX assets in the world, but also the largest library of VFX assets in the world. Like the idea was, Action VFX would be competing against Action VFX, you know? So like if we release an Explosions collection, we're gonna wanna release an Explosions volume two. We're gonna wanna release, oh, let's do dust explosions. Oh, let's do this. So it's like, even if someone was only using Action VFX, you would have so many different options that it wouldn't be this case of everyone's just pointing and recognizing like, oh, I, I know this blood splatter, <laughs> you know, it's the only one out there and stuff. So. So that's kind of how the vision went from being something very small to something much bigger than myself. And that's when it made sense to start bringing other people on board. Um, like, I remember the fact that we raised the money on Kickstarter, that was what allowed me to bring Luke on board full time at the time to actually join this. And, and then I had a brother, well, I have a brother, he's a... Uh, a very talented uh, software engineer, and he was our CTO for you know our first six years until this year we finally retired. Because whenever you're doing something, yeah, I would say whenever you're doing something in life, if you can do it by yourself, you're probably thinking too small. Because I feel like the biggest things you do need a team. You do need to surround yourself with like-minded people. So. I don't know if I'm answering your question as you wanted. Uh, feel free to, <laughs> if I'm going mm -hmm. off track, feel, feel, feel free to let me know. But that's kind of how, you know, the Action VFX team started uh, being built back in 2016. So, no, it's fascinating. I mean, it, um, yeah, I think I, I, I remember sort of seeing. I think I missed the Kickstarter, but I remember seeing the sort of first stuff coming out. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool, and they've actually thought about all these things that other people hadn't thought about. What made the first shoot a failure, if, I, if you don't mind me asking? Mm -hmm. In what way did you, why did you consider it a failure? Yeah, it's like the, the first thing is, you know how they say you don't know what you don't know until you're facing the situation and you realize, oh, wow, I don't know anything. The communication wasn't as clear as I thought it was because if I'm saying, oh, I want this type of explosion and, and it needs to look like this and it needs to do this, it is very easy for you to think, oh, the pyrotechnicians, they know exactly what I'm talking about because I, I provide them, them video references and all of those things. But then once you get on set, you realize it's not as simple as, oh, just make it go boom because there's different uh, you know, chemicals to be mixed to give different looks and different stuff. And you kind of have to be on the fly so really one of the first things I realized was this first shoot should have been, there should have been like a practice round, 
right? You can't just go straight into it. <laughs> like that's just not how how it works. There's so many unknown variables uh, to that. So that was a a big issue with it. I think our setup overall wasn't very good. For example, I had assumed that hey, if we just film it at night, then we won't really need a backdrop or anything like that because it'll be dark and you just use a luma key and you can just remove that black background and it's going to be you know super easy but then once you actually do it and you see how bright an explosion actually is even if it is night everything else is going to be reflected near it which means to then remove that background you have to essentially key out so much and key out part of the explosion to so it was just a mess and and yeah also being from an from another city because we're coming from tennessee going to chicago like this is not the type of shoot where you want to be uh on you want to be on home turf for something like mm. that because we're we're just staying at a at a hotel in in chicago and just hoping to capture everything right so so it was really just a lack of experience but just uh having so little experience in actually filming those large scale live action assets that we didn't know what we didn't know. We didn't know what we should have planned for. So, so that's kind of what, what it ended up being. I mean, honestly, the assets that we got could have sold them. Like I'm sure some people would have bought them. I just wouldn't have been happy with it, you know, like, in the entire Action VFX website, only three clips made it from that first shoot. So three clips from that first shoot were the only clips that I thought, hey, you know what, this is this is high quality enough to to belong on Action VFX. Everything else went went straight to the garbage. But it's interesting that, you know, I mean, as you say, you spent all your business money on that. And obviously you just finished college, so you had your college mm -hmm. debts and and so you made quite a quite a ballsy decision to just go. You know what? I'm 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 not. I'm actually going to throw this stuff in the bin because it's not good yeah. enough for what I want to do. Um, do you think that paid off? Oh yeah, for sure. It's like that's 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 what I said earlier. Is like I'm glad that first shoot didn't work out because assuming that first shoot worked out to my satisfaction, all that would have happened is roadypolis.com would have released an explosion pack and a fire pack, and then no one would care. But the fact that we hit those roadblocks kind of forced us to go back to the drawing board. And as I said, think bigger. And now we actually built a bigger brand around it and a brand that stood for something better than just, oh yeah, we make some stuff like other people make some stuff. It's like, no, like our mission statement for the longest time was to to build the best and largest library of VFX assets in the world. And that's been one of the main things driving us forward. So that's really interesting. Uh, one other aspect of um, stock footage that I find is really important um, in actual production is the demo files, because very mm -hmm. often we need to propose um, a slap comp uh, to the director or, or even internally to our supervisor and then they'll propose it to the director. And we once the client is like, yeah, I like that look, mm. then we buy the asset. So those demo files are, you know, a, a really big part. It's a surprisingly big part of the of of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was one thing when we we're building our website, because not many people were really doing it at the time because again, most companies were just doing the pack model. Like we wanted to, like, you'll be able to see exactly what you're getting. <laughs> like you'll never have a surprise. Like, oh, I thought this pack would have more. No, you're going to see every clip, every angle that we provide, you'll be able to go on our website, you can see it. And we even have the option to download like a watermark preview. And a lot of people do that. They just download the preview do like a test comp with it and see, okay, it's like, that's the asset that I want. And then, you know, you can have more security and confidence when you're actually buying the thing. So, so yeah, like demo footage is, is a huge thing for sure. And 
yeah, just the transparency of it. Because as a user, I would want that. I don't want to buy your pack just off of your promo video. Like, oh, this video looked cool, so I'm going to take a chance. It's like, no, like, do you actually have exactly what I need? That's what would work for me as a user. So that's what we try to do for for action VFX as because well. Because it can be very specific, right? It's not just the quality of the asset. It's things like you have, um, you have fires in windows and fires mm. going up a tree trunk and fires on a branch. Um, you have splashes uh, from, I mean, from different angles slightly full quarters you don't have like directly mm. above that's one thing i didn't see um and i guess you don't have like an actual camera dropping into the water but there are <laughs> a lot of angles and a lot of different yeah. things i just think it ones that didn't find <laughs> um but yeah there's loads of like different angles um different kinds of debris that's falling different kinds of smoke because you've got your black mm. smoke you've got like thin and you've got like that mist that you can you know, like a, a medieval kind of like yeah. knights riding across the, the, the forest kind of Excalibur mm. type thing. So you've got all those different vibes within the effects. So there's the quality, but like you say, it's the specificity. I can't even say it. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you said it better than me. But yeah, that's really important, right? Like that idea, if you yeah. need to put a fire in a window, you can't just take the the bonfire element and put it in the window. Yeah. You need a, a window frame that's burning. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the funnest to film, actually. Like every time we shoot windows, that's always super cool because, and it's just something about building something. I mean, I don't build it personally since I my hands are only for typing and <laughs> <laughs> and doing VFX, right? But but yeah, it's like just seeing the structure build and then to actually take the time to work with the power technicians again to ensure, hey, I want this fire wrapping around the window and to do this. And and the guy that we work with, his name is Robert and he's super awesome because anything within enough time, if we explain what we want, then we can build exactly, oh, we want some you know, some fire rolling off the ceiling and coming outside of the window. It's like, okay, let's let's make sure that happens. And so shooting fire is always, always super fun. That's cool. That makes me think, uh, I wonder, uh, and you can answer in the comments if you're mm -hmm. watching, uh, if you, you'd like us to talk to your, to the, your power condition. Um, anyone that hey. wants to hear that, then just put a comment in and let us know because we'll, you know, we've got... We've got Rudolf here. We can maybe maybe swing something, maybe. Hey, I mean, I'm sure he'd be down to <laughs> to talk about blowing things up with us. It's a uh, yeah. It's just but it's been a great relationship, and yeah, with him specifically, I believe we met in 2016, and he's based like he's in Tennessee, so he's local, and yeah. So since 2016, so it's been. Yeah, seven years now we've been, well, six years now we've been working with them and, and yeah, we've blown a lot of things up together. <laughs> and as a power technician, is, you, do you have other technicians for the water or the other kind of type of effects that you do or? No, it's like, because honestly, like the water stuff that we did, are you referring to like the water blasts and things? Yeah, we've got water blasts and splashes, but then of course the other aspect, I guess, um, that's a big one is the weather effects. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. Um, yeah. Because... Yeah, the, the weather stuff, like the rain, we don't really need to, all that was done by our team. Like we didn't really need to like get anyone to, to do anything like that. We simply, got on like uh, Zach Venhoy, he's our head of product development. Uh, back then when we were doing that, he was heavily involved in building different rigs. He's, he's one of those geniuses that is a very technical person, but then also can do stuff with his hands. It's like I always say, it's like those unicorns that you never, <laughs> you never meet. It's like, what, you can, you're both a nerd and you can build stuff? Like, what a man. <sighs> But I remember he worked a lot on building the rig for the rain. And 
And it's like the thing is for everything that we do, we know how important scale is because some things you can fake the scale, but other things you can't, right? It's like rain. If you really want actual large scale, a wide shot of rain, like if you go and look at our assets on, on our website, like you're not going to get that by just taking a shower head and then you know, throwing it in front of a camera and say, hey, that's rain. So I remember we had to build this this massive rig. That was maybe like 30 feet in length to be like sprinkling water and stuff like that to make that happen. So, so that was all handled by our team because usually the things that we need licensed people for are the, you know, more dangerous stuff when it comes to anything related to pyro, fire, and and things like that. But for most of the simpler stuff, like we're, we're able to simply go go to a studio and, and hand that out all ourselves, so. Yeah, that's cool. And then, so are there any categories that you feel you're missing that you're looking to fill mm. or that you're filling at the moment? Yeah, it's, uh, we've had a lot of requests for plants and trees and things. And it's kind of one of those types of assets where Maybe it's not the most exciting thing, like, oh, I want some trees. But at the end of the day, if you're a compositor and you're building a shot, a lot of the time you do want to, you know, put some trees or put some bushes somewhere. And a lot of the times you can use that to hide some imperfections in your shot, right? Hey, maybe there's a mask that's not really working as it should. It's like, hey, let's just add a little shrub, shrub there. And so... <laughs> So that's a category. We're actually working on it right now and we'll be launching, launching that pretty soon, hopefully. So that's something I'm very excited about because again, we want to be the largest library. And if you want to be the largest library, you have to focus beyond simply the exciting stuff. It's like, what are the boring stuff that is going to still help a lot of people? Yeah. Trees, trees are hard though. I mean, trees and bushes. One, one, there are a lot of different trees. Right? When someone says, "I need some trees," it's like you can't just put a pine tree in Vietnam, or you know, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you need the right kind of tree. <laughs> and then time of year. Um, yeah. And, and and then of course again scale. If we're trying to make a forest, you need the whole tree, just like you need the whole mm -hmm. explosion, so you can make put it on little cards and put them on particles and scatter them around. But then. Mm -hmm. Trees also have, um, they have parallax within them. So when you move a cap, if you, if you dolly across some trees, um, you've got parallax between the trees, which is easy. Mm -hmm. You can do that with the 3D system in Nuke or probably even After Effects. But in, um, there's that parallax within the tree that you, which is why yeah. you get so many 3D trees, you know, from mm -hmm. stuff like speed trees. So there's a lot going on with plants and trees. Um, yeah. I wouldn't, it's a it's an interesting one because it's, it's, it's potentially it's a huge one maybe the biggest mm -hmm. one that you've ever done <laughs> <laughs> every plant in the world yeah <laughs> yeah and that's one thing because with everything we do we always start a bit smaller and then based on user feedback and reception like product performance then we add more and and yeah i was actually talking with with the artists that we have working on on the trees and it was like this time next year we could still be working on trees because there's so many <laughs> options so many different things you can do so many different types of trees you know tropical trees evergreen trees you know north american trees small trees big trees you know like there's wind so, Mm -hmm. yeah the same yeah, tree with wind. different amounts of wind yeah and then you've got falling leaves and, and bare trees yeah that's so interesting. so that's definitely going to be a yeah there's a lot we can do there but i'm looking forward to it because again the fact that it's 2d assets you'll still have some limitations there but the great thing is is like we'll be delivering the exr in EXR, like the render passes and things like that to like, I've been playing around with that and like to be able to relight the tree, however you want to fit your environment and, you know, using the depth pass to, to do different cool things is, 
so it's kind of like pushing the limits on the flexibility we can provide to people while still being, you know, a, a 2D file. So, so, so I think they'll, they'll enjoy it a lot. How are you getting the depth pass on, on a tree? Are you just using standard tools or are you filming stereo or what, what, what's happening? Yeah, it's like the standard tools, nothing super, super crazy there. Like it's just kind of based on the, the distance of the branches essentially. Okay, but you're not match moving the tree with a witness cam or anything like that? Oh, know? no. When you obviously get feedback from your artist, how do you kind of make the decision? Because it's, it's a business decision, right? You've got mm. like, how much is this going to cost and how how many units am I going to sell? So how are you collecting that data and making those, mm. those final calls? Yeah, it's, uh, you're right in the sense that it is a business and at the end of the day, businesses do have to make profits. And so it's, it's always about finding the right balance between doing the most that you can, but also knowing that, hey, perhaps certain things, it's not the, the thing to be investing in right now. For example, let's say we launched a new category and let's say performance in that category is just not very good at all then it's kind of harder to justify, oh, let's spend more time here because if it's like, well, the audience is saying what they need is more blood. So, so it's <laughs> like, okay, well, obviously we'll, we'll need to do more blood because then that allows us to have the profits to do the things that sell less. And, and it's like, it's, it's, it's interesting because with our mission statement of, you know, being the best and the largest, the law just does imply that you have everything, right? Like Amazon. And, You're like yeah, the Amazon like, of the FX. Yeah, assets. and it's like, and we know that everything can't sell as well, but we do still want to do everything. You know, for example, we have a cigarette smoke collection. You know, like no one at Action VFX is retiring because we have cigarette smoke. <laughs> but we do want to have cigarette smoke because someone will need it and people do need it, even if it's not, you know, the highest selling thing. But the only way we're able to do that is if we do a lot of the highest selling things. So that's kind of the balance we have to play where, hey, we do need to make the money because the money allows us to actually provide the things that, you know, we're not going to make a ton of profits of, but it's going to still help people and it's going to help us fulfill our mission, which at the end of the day, if we're not fulfilling our mission, why exist as a company, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's always like that. But then user feedback is a big part of it. Like if you go on our products page, for example, like there'll be a sidebar and in there you'll see uh, suggest the product section. And basically that's a link that'll take you to our feature upvote page where you can request new features, vote on, you know, other assets, like other suggestions that people have made. So that's always a great way because again, if you're running a company and you're not talking to your users, you're not finding out what they want. It's kind of like the blind leading the blind. You, you, you don't know what to focus on. So, so that feature upvote page definitely helps us no, like, oh, wow, like this is, for example, we're like, it's been taking us longer than it should, but we're wanting to get some nuclear explosions, assets and stuff. And <laughs> you it's like just that... set off a nuke in uh, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, it's like Tennessee is great for blowing a lot of things up. I don't think we could do a nuke. <laughs> nuke there. So, so that's one thing we'll most likely have to do at CG. But I think like it's the highest requested asset right now. So it's like, okay, we're, we're going to, to work on that and, and, and make it happen. So, so it's a balance. And then we do user surveys. Like if you're a customer, I think like after three months or so, like you'll get like a, a survey from us picking your brain and stuff. So, so yeah, I would say a lot of it is listening to our users, but also just keeping in touch with actual uh, product performance data and just finding the right balance that lets us still make a profit while also serving our, our customers. So, And what's the weirdest request you've had from your customers for an asset? 
Oh, I think I think there was a random one that was like, "Could you make Snake Woman, please?" <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> it's like, uh, that's oddly specific. I don't, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that's the one that we'll be making. But so yeah, we've gotten some stuff like that. I'm sure if I looked at the at the feature of vote page, I could see some some funny stuff but one i mean that one wasn't super weird but it was still different was someone requested food effects like they were like hey like if you're doing a food fight in a cafeteria or something you know we'd want like tomatoes and different things <laughs> flying which i was like huh again that seems very specific i don't know if we're going to to actually film tomatoes splashing against a wall. But hey, maybe we will if there's a <laughs> if there's a need for it. But and that's the fun thing too is you know, with everything someone requests, because we're doing stock, if it's too specific, then you know that's not good. That probably won't sell. So a lot no. of the times we have to expand on those ideas to think like, okay, well, how how would we do this to actually include more? And maybe that that still helps someone. So yeah, no, I mean I think the specific stuff. You know, there's a certain point where it's like the the film production need to shoot something for their film. If yeah. It's, if you need a snake woman, you need, um, well, <laughs> you need to cast her some snake woman. And, <laughs> you know, take a while. Um, and, and then you get the complaints, um, like with the little mermaid, where it's, they say it's not realistic. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There's um, so much that would go into something like that. I don't, I don't see it working as, as stock at all. No. Um, and do you get like Flocks of Birds is another classic, sort of DMP classic is Flocks of Birds. I don't know if you have them or if it's something people have asked for. Flocks of Birds, Flocks of Bats. Oh, yeah, yeah. We actually do have some birds that we released earlier this year. It was kind of testing out uh, animals category, actually. So we released a birds collection and a bugs collection. And... And yeah, performance with those has been surprising, so we will be investing more in that. But but yeah, that's usually how we do it. We'll we'll start a new category and launch like a couple collections and then see yeah. see what people's responses are. And then we go and we figure out how to make it better. <laughs> We're big on putting ourselves out of business. It's kinda like yeah, let's treat our volume one like it's the worst thing ever and try to see what we can improve for volume two. So so I already yeah. know Birds volume two is going to be like night and day compared to our first one. So Does that mean you have to sometimes leave your hometown? I mean, if you're filming specific trees or animals or nuclear bombs, I mean, do, yeah, <laughs> do you have to go? <laughs> it's like so far we haven't yet. We haven't had to leave because I would say, yeah, so far we haven't yet. Well, some of the plans we have for the company, which not really want, we'll go into that right now, but I think more traveling may be a thing that we do eventually have to do, but it's, it's funny. Like it's been very surprising how much of action VFX we can do in Tennessee, because that was also a big concern especially relating to hiring team members. And like Tennessee is not known for, you know, film and visual effects. It's kind of like you're in the middle of, of nowhere, at least in the sense that you're secluded from the industry, right? But, but yeah, like it's, it's been, we've been able to bring, bring people to us. Um, we're, we're not too far from Atlanta, for example, which, you know, definitely has a, a much larger film film industry um than tennessee so is it is it good um uh, i guess fiscally to be in tennessee i mean there i know like sometimes if you try and film, if you want to film in like los mm. angeles you're gonna spend a lot of money on just yeah. permits and things like that is it is it is there other, no, other yeah. advantages to just being tennessee from that point of view oh yeah for sure and especially as an entrepreneur too because that was a that was a big reason 
I moved from Miami after college and moved back to Tennessee was I already knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and Miami as a city is like super expensive to live in, right? And as an entrepreneur, you have to take risks. As I mentioned with blowing the entire business savings on one shoot that <laughs> didn't work out, but ended up working out. So yay. So I went there, but so, so yeah, I mean, the fact that where we live is a much cheaper, cheaper class of living, which is great. Um, tennis is great for, you know, no state income tax, for example. So it's like, it's all great to pay taxes, but I'll pay less taxes when I can. And especially as a business owner, the less you pay in taxes, the more you can invest into the business, the more you can invest in, you know, growing the team and doing more of that. So, so yeah, like there's definitely, you know, some good financial advantages of being where we are. And the fact that, I mean, what we do, I mean, we sell our assets online, right? It's like, we don't necessarily need to be in LA or in New York to make action view effects work. In fact, just like you said, shooting pyro stuff in, in California would be a lot harder, a lot more expensive than doing it in Tennessee. So it's kind of like, Hey, this, this works pretty perfect for, for where we are at. It's like the hardest thing is just like, if you're wanting to hire people with more industry experience, and you want them to move to Johnson City, Tennessee, then that's of course a bit harder because you're not in that hub. But I mean, we've, we've been making it work, so. Is everyone in your company working in the office or do you have lots of remote uh, No, I would say, I would say maybe two, two thirds are local, like in the office and then one third would be uh, remote from from all over the place, so. Cool. Well, um, first of all, anyone that wants to ask further questions, post them in the comments and we'll try and you know find an answer. But I would yeah, like maybe, to Maybe ask, we'll do a, a second interview one I think one it time. would be cool. I think it would be good. And um, yeah, and then of course we can, we can use our own, you know, our listeners questions, which would be great. Um, I guess my first question, my last question, a good ending question mm -hmm. is for anyone that wants to start their own business within this industry, mm -hmm. um, what, what would your advice be? Yeah, so my first advice would be, you have to know what game you're playing. And what I mean by that is, if my goal is to be a very successful visual effects artist, there's different steps I'm going to need to take, right? There's different software I'll maybe need to learn, different experience I'll need to learn. And, but if my goal is to start a business, like it's not necessarily, oh, I need to go learn a software, you know, because, and that was a mistake I did at the, at the start. I, I remember I would have like yearly goals and it would be like, oh, learn this software. And then eventually I realized that I was kind of being an idiot because it's like, I'm not playing the VFX artist game. I'm playing the entrepreneur game and I don't need to know every software maybe I need to hire someone that knows that software, but I myself don't need to do it. It's like where I need to be growing is in my leadership skills, management skills, uh, just business acumen in general, understanding, you know, more about the market and, you know, how to actually make good sound business decisions. Things I need to be focusing on is growing the team is, are we having a company and an environment where people actually want to join? So, so that, that would be my first advice is, you know, don't do like I did and only figure out like two years in like, oh wait, like I'm still <laughs> thinking like I'm an artist. What am I doing is like automatically know that, hey, you don't need to know everything. That's not what's, what's going to make like the same things that made you very successful as an artist is not going to be the same things that make you successful as a business owner because it's a different skill set so so that would be a big piece of advice i would say second one would be it is possible it is possible you can do it you can in fact start a business and it doesn't have to be you know this very black and white oh i need to go raise x amount of money from you know some venture capitalist and things like that because 
I think you can start small. Like you can really start something while you have a full-time job, while that's not your full-time thing. And, and just go little by little and grow it until the time is right where it makes sense. Okay, I'm going to to quit my main thing and do that. Because that's kind of what I did. You know, for years I was still freelancing, making music videos and commercials and things like that until around 2014 was when I was like, okay, I've grown Rody Polis enough to be able to focus on just that to try to take it to the next level. So, so that would be a big piece of advice, just believing that it is possible and that it doesn't have to be the zero to a hundred you know, instantly. Of course, if you if you do raise more money, then sure that does help speed things up a little bit. Where hey, instead of you know taking five years, maybe something could take two years or one year. But at the same time, at least for me, the process of building, you know, something is just so fulfilling to see the little steps being put in place, and then you can look back and think like, oh wow, like we've made a lot of progress. Like that's that's always been been super cool to me. And, and I guess last thing I would say is don't assume you know everything when it comes to the legal side of stuff because I think that's when you're starting out, that's one of the first things you maybe just don't think about. And it's that, oh, we don't need contracts. It's like word is bond and all of those things and it's like I, I would not I would not recommend that because don't assume that your thing is too small to to not care about those details because hey it may be small now but that's not the goal so you know five years from now when you have a multi-million dollar company did you do those early steps at the beginning that you're not screwing yourself accidentally so so that's a big thing yeah think of all the say. bands that split up because they do exactly that they mm -hmm. they don't think of the business side and then they hate each other because that one's taking all the money yeah yeah and that makes me think of another point too and i'll say that one because that's something i wish someone told me early on is when you're running a business firing is as natural as hiring that's just that's just part of it. Like if you have to let go of someone, it doesn't mean that it's a failure on your part. Like, oh, like the goal is to never have to let go of anyone. It's it's like no, like it's just a natural part of running a business. It's by far my least favorite part of running a business. Like I get no enjoyment, no satisfaction at all about having to to let a team member go because I do care a lot about the team, but at the same time, sometimes those decisions are what's needed to, for the betterment of everyone else in the company. Like if there's an important role and it's, it needs to be fulfilled well and it's not happening and you, and you don't have the courage to let that person go, then the business suffers and then, hey, maybe the business fails and now you have to let everyone go. You know, you didn't really win anything there. So, so yeah, it's, uh, and I'm just saying that because I know like letting go of someone, like firing someone, no one gets enjoyment out of that. Well, maybe there's like one person of the population that yeah, gets like, <laughs> enjoyment yeah. out of that, but it's like, I would hope no one gets enjoyment out of that. And I know it's not talked about enough to where especially at the beginning, I remember my first, the first time I had to, you know, let go of someone, it was very hard and it was very emotionally taxing because it was almost like, this feel, this is wrong. Like you can't let go of someone, you have to keep them forever. And it's, it just creates like a lot of unhealthy um, balance that I see in a lot of entrepreneurs. So I'm mainly saying this to kind of free someone into knowing mm -hmm. that, look, do your best when you're hiring, take your time to make sure you bring the right person on board, but it's not always going to work out, but that's part of running a business. It is a natural process. So, yeah, I mean, I would say sometimes uh, for me, like I've, I've been made redundant. I've not been fired, but I've been made redundant and it was actually a positive thing. I actually did a lot better as a result of that. I was sort of hanging on longer than I probably should have done in that particular company mm -hmm. anyway. So it was a very good thing. 
uh, especially being redundant because then you get a bit of money when you do it a bit of money to look for something better but um my question to you is actually when you do have to hire when you when you do have to fire someone, what mm -hmm. is your advice as the, the best way to do that ethically and uh, professionally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, I would say the first thing is like at Action VFX, we believe in in the moment feedback. So it's like a lot of companies have like the annual reviews, for example. And, you know, when we have qu quarterly reviews that we do, so it's like four times a year we look at those things. But on top of that is the idea of in the moment feedback for stuff. So it's not like, oh, I, I noticed a problem, you know, in January. And then I'm thinking, oh, you know, in March, I'll meet with this person and I will address this issue with them. It's like, no, if you notice the problem in January, talk about it in January. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you want to have given the person a chance to make the necessary improvements. And they can't do that if you either are too scared or too undisciplined to actually talk to them about those improvements. So I would say like it kind of starts there on are you actually communicating things, communicating things right? And yeah, I would say no the one wants to be told they you tell, told they're great the whole time and then fired. It's, it's yeah. unethical to do that, right? It's, yeah, right. So it's like that's that's not that wouldn't be how I would want to be treated. So why would we do this to, to someone else? And I would say like the other thing is, especially if you are kind of close to making a decision, then there needs to be conversations to happen there. Like whether it's putting that person on a performance improvement plan to see if you can course correct something. Because what you want to do is and I guess that's just how I do things naturally again, because like my first instinct is not, oh, you need to, you know, fire this person. It's like, no, it's like, can, can this be salvaged? Because at the end of the day, I love sleep. I love sleeping at night peacefully. And I would want to know that, hey, I did try. I did want to make this thing work. And it just wasn't the, the best thing. And Has it worked? Have, have you been able to turn it around with someone that maybe wasn't working out and... It's rare, but it has happened. And I would say like the one person I'm thinking specifically is weren't really sure about him. But then we realized that it was mainly on his current role that he was in because he had a lot of strengths in some other areas, but then the role that we had him in required something different that after trying, we were like, okay, like he can do better, but he's never going to be excelling at the level that we want. And we're able to actually pivot him to a slightly different role. And that actually worked great because he was able to grow and eventually get a promotion in that role, which was super cool to see. But, but yeah, like, but that's the thing too. It's the word balance because it's, it is definitely rare to like, if you start having problems with someone and you're communicating and then you're still having problems with someone, it's. It's like, it's probably not going to, not going to be, be fixed. Um, I think one thing we're getting better at action VFX is, you know, making that decision faster because you don't want to spend six months trying to fix, fix someone. And then it's like, well, it didn't really work out. Well, that's spent, you know, maybe one or two months trying to, trying to do that. And, and I would say the last thing we try to do is in terms of like severance pay and things like that, because I mean, at the end of the day, a job provides income for someone and income pays their bills and things like that. So it's like, I've always tried to go the extra mile with, you know, the, the severance pay, because we have the contract and the contract says, I think like two weeks. Right. But it's like, I've never actually given a two week severance based on the contract because it's usually, hey, if the company is doing well and we can't afford it, I do generally want that person to to have a little bit of cushion as they make the transition to to like the, their next job, the next position somewhere else. So so these are kind of like some of the things uh, we keep in mind at the company to try to 
you know, both treat the person fairly, but also make the decisions that need to be made for the business to continue being successful. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a very important subject. It's a taboo subject. Um, so I'm glad that we were able to um, discuss it. Um, However, I would like to end on a high note, just mm. <laughs> um, as we come yeah, to the end. So, positive. No, but uh, so my, I guess the thing is, what's, uh, what's next? Um, what's happening uh, in the next six months? Yeah. Yeah, so we definitely have a lot of cool stuff coming up. One, one big request we've, we've gotten for a few years now, and I'm big on focus, so I didn't really want to focus on that too early but it's the basically 3d assets it's like we've been mainly 2d assets well been only 2d assets and it's kind of like well there's different things we can do with 3d whether that's like the vdbs you know alembic files or even like 3d models and things like that so that's something we've been looking into a lot a lot closer and so pretty soon we'll be able to start moving towards that and actually having more types of assets that can. Are, are, are we talking about scanned assets? Are we talking, you know, assets that are built completely in three D, or what are we? It would be mainly DDBs stuff that obviously built will completely. Be. Yeah, yeah. So so whether it's like the smoke or explosions or debris or things like that. So it's because you can provide as many angles as you want for 2d stock assets that's never going to cover everything and sometimes people will just say can i just get this and play around with it so so it'll be a little bit before we launch that to the public because there's still some things to figure out in terms of properly delivering like those large cash files to to users and stuff uh it's gonna be a they pretty big. big download so so we're still figuring out some of those kinks to, to make it happen. Um, and then later, what I would say in Q1 of next year, one of the big things I'm looking forward to is going to be relating to, because we do have some tutorials that we create, because part of it too is, hey, what value can we provide to, to users? And one thing we've realized is a lot of people don't have demo shots that they can just practice on because hey if i want to be a compositor and i want to learn i'm not planning on going out and with my red camera to go shoot you know a plate so that i can practice on and it's kind of like well where would you find a plate to practice on and so that's kind of one of those things where we film so many plates for our own demo shots that we feel like oh we can just make this available to the public and you know, anyone from a student to, you know, high school student to anyone that wants to practice something, they can just find footage, you know, for free and just use and practice on. So, so that's one of those give back projects that we're, we're going to be doing early next year. I'm really looking forward to that because yeah, I think that's a, that's definitely a big need for people. So that's all, that's awesome. Now, that sounds really exciting. Um, and it's a whole new world uh mm. to a certain extent i'm really excited to see more of that and definitely look to get you back and hear what other people want to ask you yeah for sure so everyone please post your questions and um yeah that's amazing thank you so much for your time thanks for having and me and we'll speak to you soon have a good one Okay, so the code is quite simple. It's TVAP, all caps, TVAP, and you go onto the Action VFX page, and there you go, enter the code. In case you can't remember it, it's on our website. So when this interview goes on our website, it will be there.